that what in fact consciousness is, it's a quantum effect and it's drawn up by structures in the brain called microtubules. And we bring consciousness is not in the brain. Consciousness is processed by the brain, like a radio processes a radio signal. So our ability to see the greater universe, our ability for peak experiences and everything else, our experiences for Kundalini experiences, having out of the body experiences, all these things are restricted by the brain. It's only when we start to be using the neuro neuroglial network that we'll start to expand our consciousness and move outwards. Right now on Higher Journeys with Alexis Brooks. It is always a pleasure to be in the presence of greatness. And I, I say that not to <laughs> brown nose you, Anthony Peak, but I, I think of you as one of the top thinkers of our time. And I know that uh, I'm not alone in that sentiment. I'm so delighted to have you back on Higher Journeys after I think probably two, three years, maybe even four, to talk about something so incredibly powerful. Everything that you touch having to do with the nature of reality, everything you have invested yourself in having to do with altered states and how that can take us into vistas never uh, before explored is fascinating. So welcome back. Let's get into it. It's going to be fascinating. What an amazing introduction. What can I say? Other than <laughs> thank you. I know you've been up to a lot. Journeyers, I just found out that Tony is closing in on his 13th book and it's coming out when? 13th book. Yeah, it will be due out in January or February of 2025. Oh, it'll be, okay. It's scheduled to come out in the States, Canada, okay. Europe, and the UK. Beautiful. And then the previous one was Cheat the Ferryman, yes? Correct. We're going to be talking about all sorts of things having to do with the nature of reality. But before we even get into all of the uh, these areas, I want to ask you a question. What is Cheat the Ferryman? Right. Okay. Um, probably a little thing that people don't know about me is that my background has always been in business. Um, and I was a business executive for many, many years, um, both in airlines, um, high technology, uh, hospitals, various places. And one of the things that um, had always interested me was branding and coming up with concepts that people would remember. And the concept of cheating the ferryman came to me in, in a, one of these kind of flashes of inspiration, probably Damon inspired, and we'll touch on the Damon later if we want. But cheating the ferryman effectively is to do with, in ancient Greek times, when somebody died, what would happen is their friends would place either two coins over the eyes, or they'd place one coin in the mouth. The coins were called oboli, singular obolus. And the reason the coins were given was that the Greeks believed that when you died, you became what was called a shade and you would find yourself on the banks of the River Styx. And while you were on the banks of the River Styx, the mist would part and a boatman would appear and he would come over and he would allow you to get in the boat, but you had to pay him to cross the River Styx to go to the land of the dead. This is all very much the belief, beliefs of the people called the pre-Socratics. Then, so you paid your obelai and you went across to the River Styx to the land of the dead, to Hades. Now, my argument is, my hypothesis is that we cheat the ferryman. We never pay him his obelai because something peculiar happens in the brain at the point of death, which means that we never cross the River Styx. Now, I'd just like to expand a second on this because it's quite important to just focus in on the what the ancient Greeks actually believed happened. Now, the River Styx is one of a number of rivers of the underworld. And another river of the underworld was the Acheron. And another one was the River Lethe, L-E-T-H-E. And the River Lethe was of particular importance to ancient Greek beliefs because the ancient Greeks believed that you could go back and live your life again. But in order to do so, you had to forget who you were before. And to do that, you had to drink the waters of the Leith because it was the river of forgetting. 
Now, what the ancient Greeks believed is that we all suffer from something called amnesis, which is literally forgetting in Greek. And when you drank the waters of the Leith, you were put into amnesis. You would then be taken back across the, 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 the sticks and you would live your life again. Either you'd be reincarnated either as another person or as yourself. It depends on the, the, the belief systems of the group. Now, these all tie in very much to my, my own cheating the ferryman hypothesis, because I argue that the ancient Greeks had a great deal of wisdom. And of course, the ancient Greek belief systems then moved into Gnosticism and to the occult belief systems of the Kabbalah, uh, Sufism and many other, other esoteric groups. So basically, cheating the ferryman is a hypothesis that really we never die. There are so many belief systems wrapped up into the story that you stories that you share having to do with drinking of those waters, giving us amnesia. I've heard you talk before about your your hypothesis on why we typically don't have recall of past lives and that perhaps might be a mistake that it is in the recall that helps us develop in the current incarnation. In other words, understanding the, the previous incarnations help in the development. It, it's literally part of our evolutionary tra trajectory. Um, well, this is exactly why the ancient Greeks wanted to get into the state of anamnesis, which was okay. the loss of forgetting. Yes. Was to be able to remember your previous lives. Now, I'd argue that neurologically there is evidence to say there is a part of us that does remember our previous lives. And I call that entity the daemon. Um, and that is the part of you that has lived your life many times and also has access to information from past lives of other people. Now, effectively, in terms of some people have argued and said my hypothesis contradicts reincarnation. It doesn't. All I argue is, is that there is you, which is the, the, the being that lives one life, which is called the Eidolon. Then there is the daemon, which is the universe, it's the you that lives many, many lives. But then above that is something I call the uber daemon, mm -hmm. which is like the Jungian collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. And it's the uber daemon that when people have past life recall, that's what that is the information field, the Akashic field, for want of a better term, that they're picking up on. They're picking up on the uber daemon. And on top of that, you then get the idea of how we have deja vu how we can have precognition that's when you're attuning into the memory banks of the daemon and in the end of my last book cheating the ferryman i also present another level which which i believe is hypothetically possible which i call the godamon and the godamon is effectively the equivalent of what the kabbalists would call you or ein sof it's what the vedantists call brahman it's basically the consciousness of everything. Mm -hmm. It's in fact the ultimate reality. It is in fact everything that there is. We are just simply emanations. We are perceivers of an information field that is created by the, the Godemon. It seems that we um, inexplicably have brushes with all of these aspects of the daemon. Um, unsolicited, they, they tend to be very automatic. I think when people talk about their uh, peak experiences that come, including my own that happened in 2005, we glimpse some aspect of the daemon. Uh, does that make sense? Oh, totally. I mean, the, the idea of the Maslowian peak experience is something that is, because probably again, a little known thing about me is by training, I'm a sociologist. I have, I have a degree in sociology and I did, mm -hmm. did postgraduate in sociology and social psychology. So, and this is the, and also I'm a qualified psychometrician. So these, these are areas that really fascinate me anyway. Mm. But in terms of the sociology, Abraham Maslow, and I have a section on Abraham Maslow in my new book, Love you know, you know, Maslow came up with the idea that um, we are self-actualizing. There's a hierarchy of needs. And the idea is that, you know, when you're first in existence, you need shelter, you need food, then you need other things. But ultimately, we're all after what's called the peak experience, which, of course, is a pun on my name. I'm sure Abraham Laszlo had no idea that Anthony Peake would be advocating the peak experience. Oh, my experience. God, I just thought about that. Yeah, <laughs> sure enough. But, but in fact, what, you know, people, one or two people have actually called 
encountering my work to be the literal peak experience, mm. which, which I think is quite uh, quite amusing. But Maslow is fascinating, and you. So you've had a peak experience yourself. You've had the Indeed. opening up. I, I sure have. Two thousand and five. It's an exhaustive um, a chronology that I'm not going to bore you all with. Well, it, it, actually, it's not that boring. <laughs> but this isn't the time. We'll talk about that offline. Okay. I will say, uh, Anthony, that it lasted three months. Wow. It was sustained for three months and probably literally uh, put me in the seat that I'm sitting in right now. But uh, mm -hmm. in fact, okay. I'm working with others now, um, coaching, I guess you could say, I don't necessarily like that term, but as a spiritual um, coach and advisor, because so many people are having iterations of these experiences. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that's no accident, all that's going on right now. But I digress. I digress. Uh, wow. Where do we go from here? The daemon. Could could one also refer to this as the higher self sort of cliche? Of course. Of course. It's exactly what it is. It has been known through centuries as lots of things. I use the term daemon. Sometimes I possibly regret picking up on that term, but that term is the term that the, the Stoics, the ancient Greeks, and the ancient Romans used for their higher self. Technically, the Romans called it the genius mm -hmm. and the ancient Greeks called it the daemon. And I, again, because I referenced earlier on Socrates and the pre-Socratics, um, Socrates himself had a daemon and the, his daemon manifested very early in his life and he had regular conversations with the daemon. And there's a general consensus of opinion that a lot of esoteric traditions, and I know this from friends of mine who are in esoteric traditions, um, that the whole point of a lot of occultism is to find the inner self, to find the inner advanced part of you. E even things like, I know that it, 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 there's a lot of negativity about, but even the concepts of L. Ron Hubbard and his concept of the operating Thetan within Scientology, it's all looking for the same thing. We have various, there's been books written over the years of the Book of Arantia, uh, which is mm -hmm. part of the, the the tradition here as well. We have Blavatsky talking about uh, ascended masters. These these are all attuning in to this other part of ourselves that is us but is not, in the sense that it is our eternal self. And of course, it's discovered in movies. There's so many movies now. It's a trope within movies all the time. Um, and I suggest this is because a lot of people when they come across my work have a have a hidden recognition it's as if my work is helping them with anamnesis mm. Mm. it's helping them remember and realizing that there is something here it's and you know we, we if we have time you know as you know with me i don't just make these statements this is all based upon science this is all based upon neurology and neurochemistry split brain operations you know, there's so much evidence out there. Deep hypnotism. Uh, a guy called Ernest Hilgard many years ago, a world famous um, hypnotist, came up with a concept he called the hidden observer. And the hidden observer is the daemon. The hidden observer is somebody that when you put somebody into deep levels of hypnotism, something else manifests. Absolutely. And that something else is the daemon. It can even and produce uh, biological changes. I'm, I'm mm. told at times, eye color, you know, certainly oh. cadence and voice. I mean, some might call it what possession is all about. Or oh, walk -in, very much and so. The walk-in phenomenon. The walk-in phenomenon has long intrigued me because I think this is another way in which the daemon communicates. And again, a few years ago, I wrote a book with Irvin Laszlo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and in that, we discussed about mediumship and how mediumship functions. And a number of my friends who are mediums agree with me totally on this, that when they are channeling whatever it is that assists them, the medium that they use, it's another part of themselves. It's an aspect of themselves that they attune into. And it is this something that knows more. And of course, in my book, Opening the Doors of Perception, I again, I again do the neurology of this. I have something I call the Huxley and Spectrum which is um, a continuum from neurotypicals to people like myself who suffer from classic migraine, where the doors of perception are slightly open. 
to people who experience temporal lobe epilepsy, mm -hmm. to people who experience schizophrenia, to people who uh, experience Alzheimer's, people who experience Gershwin syndrome. There's a lot of these things. And most of my associates who experience, particularly people who experience temporal lobe epilepsy, agree with me totally. I'll guarantee there'll be individuals out there listening to this who experience temporal lobe epilepsy who will know exactly what I'm talking about. You guys will know about your daemon. Your daemon will have been with you all your life. And indeed, before we started, I was talking to you about a friend of mine who lives in, um, in, in, uh, in, in LA, a guy called Myron Dial. And Myron's daemon is called Caron. And Myron's daemon actually manifested when when Myron was six years of age um, and has been his companion all his life. Hmm. Philip, Philip K. Dick is somebody I've written about. Philip K. Dick was fascinated by this idea of the other part of our personality. And indeed, in one of Philip K. Dick's famous books, Valis, he he has his own daemon in the book. He has two characters, one called Philip Dick and the other character is called Horse Love of Fat which is a very clever pun because horse lover fat sounds like a really strange name till you realize that in Greek, horse lover is Phil Hippus or Philip and Dick is German for fat. So horse lover fat is in fact, Philip, Philip Dick. Anthony, I am listening to everything that you're saying. And I have to say, I resonate deeply with the question because I pose it as a question as I too am a researcher in phenomena, particularly when it comes to contact with non-human intelligence of which there is a huge spectrum, the shadow being phenomenon, any type of sentient entity that is said to come into an individual space and interact with it, I have often asked the question, how do we know, or could it be that this is an aspect of the self from the beginning? I've always put that question somewhat on the back burner and just observed, could it be that what we are interacting with is some tangible aspect of the self? You and I have talked about the tulpa before as an example, mm, which yes, I find yes. extraordinarily <laughs> intriguing. Something, the jinn for that matter, all of mm -hmm. these so-called uh, entities that, that live outside of us or external to us. I have felt that there is a symbiosis that exists between us and them. And you have gone into explicit detail and really making the case that could be. Oh, totally. I, I, I call them the egregorials. And the reason uh, I'm, I'm building up an egregorial model of reality in that I believe that, and I think there's strong scientific evidence this, particularly from quantum mechanics. And I mean, real quantum mechanics, not new age quantum mechanics, that there is a direct relationship between our act of observation and the external world and that our anticipations can bring about manifestations in external reality and indeed these manifestations use us to come through they're part of us but not they they mm. the, you know it's the the arguments that people like Jacques Vallée have been using for many many years Brad Steiger was arguing similar arguments um, and going right back through ufology as well. You know, there's this idea of how the beings seem to anticipate what we expect them to look like. Um, and I believe that this is because they, they attune into our brains in some way. And they use us to draw themselves through into this three-dimensional reality that we exist within. And they manipulate us and they have fun with us. You know, there's very much this kind of joker aspect that takes place you know valley was is very interested in this um and the idea that they're playing with us they're having fun and of course in my writings as well i discuss in great detail uh dimethyltryptamine entities and when people experience entities during dimethyltryptamine they seem to be the same you know the terence mckenna machine elves are exactly the same as the fey they're the same as tulpas they're the same as these beings just are part of us. They're part of our greater ecology, as it were, and they use us in some way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I spent some time um, two years ago, I was out in Jordan. And this is a really strange story. I, I was out in Jordan and I, I managed to be taken. 
I, I went to Petra, but being me and, 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 you know, I wasn't really interested in just seeing the main Petra. I wanted to see the back areas of Petra and um, managed to find a guy, a guide who took us out to the places that the, the, the tourists don't usually go to. And he took us to a particular cave that the jinn supposedly manifested in this cave. And it did have an incredibly strange atmosphere. But what was peculiar was that about six months later, quite by chance, I came across a, a Jordanian TV series on the jinn. And they used that very cave. Really? For the, for the filming of the manifestation of the jinn. And I thought, did this guide know? I mean, there's a possibility he knew that this cave was in the film or in the movie or in the TV series, but it's on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And that was the very, very um, place I was in. What's you know, the so. name of it? Do you recall? Because we, we can link it. It had something, it had gin in the title. I'll find out for you and I'll That'd send you the link. Okay. It's very, very interesting uh, because it's a group of Jordanian kids that go down to Petra, do what I did, went off piste and went to the back of Petra where the the the, the rock form the uh, the rock carvings are still there, but there's nobody there, and they have this most creepy feeling. And I do intend in the future. There is um uh, I was in Oman a few years ago, and there is a place out in the desert in Oman called the Cave of the Jinn, and it's huge, it's massive, um, and I've always wanted to go there to see what we could manifest there, particularly because I work with a couple of Austri Austrian researchers. Uh, called Dr. Engelbert Winkler or Dr. Dirk Prokel have something called the uh, lucid light machine. In fact, there was a lucid light machine that I managed to get at contact in the desert last year. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that maybe they'll get the machine here the next year. Thanks. I, I remind myself I need to contact and see if they'll get them there again. But there's, there's a lot in this. And a person that we really want to talk to on this, funnily enough, is a guy called um, um, uh, Paul Eno. Uh, Paul Eno. Mm -hmm. uh, who lives in uh, New England, and oh, he's been researching. My home. Okay, he lives yeah. actually in in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and he's been researching um, entities, and he argues that they 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 manifest via plasma. And his his book, uh, Dancing Past the Graveyard, is extraordinary. It's wow. well worth reading. It is That's, extraordinary. Let's look into that. My gosh, so okay. much! You are just a repository of so much. I I, I want to go back to you made you're putting so much into every every answer you give me and i'm trying to recall let's go back to the neurological very very interesting neurological connections that happen in a lot of different phenomenological situations like ndes obes uh and encounters ufo encounters you've made reference to to dimethyltryptamine dmt and other hallucinogens i i would imagine ayahuasca would be in there because there is dmt i believe in ayahuasca yes. right yeah, it's a major component right but the, so so we're looking at what what is the perfect storm if you will that would that could bring about these sorts of entities experiences yes but the entities the personalities themselves that may in fact be an aspect of us perhaps um, the brain, let's go to the brain first. And, and again, I'm speaking out of school guys, because I'm not a neurologist and, and I'm, I'm a fan of how the brain works. I think it's such a mystery and so powerful, but when we think of the brain and some of the references that you've made, Anthony, could the brain act in some cases as almost like a mini portal? If you're enjoying this episode, along with all of the subjects that we cover here on Higher Journeys, then I invite you to join our members only community on Patreon, where we go even deeper into the conversations with the guests that you know and love. Not only does your membership ensure that we can keep this work going and growing, but you'll also get immediate access to our exclusive after shows. Get up close and personal with the guests of the show, along with many other member perks. So click on the link below to join now or visit higherjourneys.com where you'll find the Patreon link. We'll see you on the journey. Thanks. A portal. The, the brain, according to research over the years, and particularly research that's been taking place over here in the UK at the University of Sussex, the brain acts as an attenuator. The brain is there to take out information. It isn't there to add in information. The, mm. brain, the brain is designed in order for us to exist within this physical world, the, this, this, this physical world we find ourselves within. 
the brain cannot be dis you know i use the argument once you know there's little point in in having all information coming in if you've got a saber-toothed tiger in front of you you need to be able to react to the saber-toothed tiger and get away so the brain is there to focus on particular pieces of information but i believe that under certain circumstances as same with my Hux huxley and spectrum there are certain circumstances where we we can attune into a wider perceptual field mm -hmm. and when we do that it leaves us open also to things coming in as much as us perceiving things in the same way. Now, for instance, it was intriguing, the research that was done at the University of Sussex, what they did was they took a group of people and they gave them psilocybin, magic mushrooms, and they rigged them up with a PET scan, MRI scan, whatever, scanning the brain itself. So scanning brain activity while somebody is in a hallucinogenic psilocybin state. They expected that what would happen is that all parts of the brain would light up in certain ways. It did the opposite. It switched areas of the brain off. Areas of the brain were switched off in order to allow us to perceive the greater world. Now, in one of my books, and I think I'm the only person in the world, including neurologists, and if there are any neurologists out there or anybody that is into this, please contact me and tell me I'm wrong on this because I'm quite open to people telling me I'm wrong. Do you know you hear the, ter the term, we only use 10% of our brains? Lots of people misinterpret that. What it actually means is that 10% of the brain's functioning is neurological in the sense that it's neurons. So it's neuron cells communicating with other neuron cells using neurotransmitters to facilitate messages across the brain. However, the 90% of the brain is not neurons. 90% of the cerebral cortex is made up of cells called glial cells. Now, glial cells, literally, glial is, is Greek for glue. And the neurologists have long believed that the glial cells are just there to hold the neurons in place, to facilitate the neurons. But recent science has made some astonishing discoveries about these neuro these um, glial cells. It's particularly a form of glial cell called astrocytes. Astrocytes communicate with each other using a totally different way of communication. It's called the calcium wave. They use calcium ions to communicate. Now, there is growing evidence that these cells may communicate non-locally. Mm. Now, by non-locality, I mean the quantum physics concept of non-locality. The idea of you take two subatomic particles, you place them in the same quantum state, and then you place them thousands of miles away from each other. If you put an action on one, the other one knows instantaneously. It's from the EPR paradox from 1937, okay. Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen. Mm -hmm thought experiment, which was then theoretically proven by an Irish CERN um, physicist called John Bell in, I think, 1964. And in 1981, Bell's hypothesis was Bell's exclusion. Bell's hypothesis, theorem? Is Bell's that theorem, yeah, mm -hmm. correct, was proven by a guy, uh, three guys, and two of them are Alain Aspe and, and Dalabard at, at, uh, in Paris in 1981, where they did an experiment to prove that non-locality and instantaneous communication takes place. So we know this instantaneous takes place, but imagine the scenario that within the brain, there are brain cells that can communicate instantaneously, and which means they can create patterns within the brain, and they can swirl information around the brain much quicker than neurons can. Now, on top of that, which is even more intriguing, is that um, these these cells, these, these, the, these cells seem to be able to explain some of the mysteries of modern neurology. Like, for instance, I always say there are two things that you will stop in their tracks. Um, a, 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 an advocate of scientism, a person that just believes that science has got it all right. One of them is called the way of wave particle duality which they haven't got a clue about. But the other one, which is the one I'm focusing in now, 
is called the binding problem within the brain. And it's phenomenally interesting because we have a feeling of simultaneity all the time, don't we? You know, everything is happening now. That's not how the brain works. If you see a red bouncing ball going down the street, the redness is being processed in your visual cortex. The bouncing of the ball is being processed in a different part of the brain. And other elements of the image you're seeing is processed in another part of the brain. But they seem to be communicating instantaneously to create the image of a red bouncing ball. Interesting. Now, this isn't possible using the neurological model, but it is possible using the astroglial model. So it means we need to, if we started tuning into this astroglial model, suddenly is this where consciousness is? Mm. Is this why we can't find the location of memory in the brain? Because, of course, we have something called or orchestrated objective reduction, which is a model that's been put forward by Stuart Hammerhoff, who's a professor of anesthesiology at the University of Arizona, and Sir Roger Penrose, who's a British mathematician at the yes. University of Cambridge. And these two have come up with a model saying that what, in fact, consciousness is, it's a quantum effect. And it's drawn up by structures in the brain called microtubules. And we bring consciousness is not in the brain. Consciousness is processed by the brain, like a radio processes a radio signal. So our ability to see the greater universe, our ability for peak experiences and everything else, our experiences for Kundalini experiences, having out of the body experiences, all these things are restricted by the brain. It's only when we start to be using the neuro neuroglial network that we'll start to expand our consciousness and move outwards. If that makes sense. Again, I always give very oh long my answers. Gosh, to short well, questions. I'm thinking of names, of course, the holographic universe by by Talbot, Talbot goes into brilliant. exhaustive detail where he cites Carl Prebrum's work in terms yeah. of how memory can't be isolated in uh, certain parts of the brain. So, yes, amazing stuff. And Anthony has uh, put out an invitation for anyone that wants to debate that that hypothesis of his. You're welcome to. Uh, connect i suppose so oh yeah as far as i'm concerned I, I want to be right it's important for me for my information to be right if you read my books there are literally hundreds and hundreds of references everything i'm saying now in my books is backed by science mm -hmm. hypothetical theoretical or actual you have such an elegant way of explaining it as well that even the lay person would understand i hope that uh, this resonates with a lot of you listening and watching out there the brain is, has always, though, eluded those uh, the finest in the field, uh, as well as lay people. It's a fascinating organ, indeed. And the the point that you made about the ten percent uh, uh, idea that we only use ten percent of our brain, and you, I don't need to regurgitate that. You all heard him loud and clear. But it makes me think, Tony, of people who have brain injury. Mm -hmm. uh, whether stroke or another, uh, uh, you know, blow to the brain, literally, where certain psi phenomena will increase exponentially. This has been documented many, many times. I'm also reminded of some, just throwing this all out there and you can comment as you will. Um, we know that flotation therapy, which is sensory deprivation, has become very popular. A lot of people are doing that in order to uh, sort of uh, uh, perturb uh, certain types of experiences. So the inference is that the, the uh, taking, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm really just trying to distill in my layman's terms, when you shut down a certain aspect of the brain, something else in the other part of the brain can allow for a wider perceptual field, it seems. When I say perceptual, I mean vision, but just the whole experience of reality. I, am I making any sense at all? No, you're it's completely right. I mean, again, in my book, Opening the Doors of Perception, this is the central concept of the way in which the doors are effectively closed for most of us. Mm -hmm. But for individuals, for instance, I'm quite fascinated by um, autism. Absolutely. And and the elements of autism. Now, I took the opportunity to work um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a management consultant at a local school here, which is a school for children who have epilepsy and or autism. 
and I used to spend a lot of time with the 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 head of psychiatry there and the head of neurology because they have the neurological units and everything else as well. And I used to talk to the the people who ran the houses that the children lived in. And the stories I was told, was told were extraordinary. You know, these children know they have an other knowing. Mm -hmm. They know what time it is. They they have abilities. They attune into a different level of reality to what we attune into. Mm -hmm. um, and many of them, many of them suffer is the wrong term, mm. but many of them had synesthesia. I'm you know, a synesthete. Were, I'm a you're synesthete. a synesthete. Yes, really? I am. Indeed. Tell me more. So what, well, how does your synesthesia manifest? Well, again, you're going to have to interview me on your podcast. I, I want to focus yes. on you. Well, okay. we, we, I'll tell you very briefly. And synesthesia is something that we have covered on the show due to the fact that I uh, didn't even know it had a name. I, I knew I had the... Uh, some of the attributes, chiefly uh, days of the week. Today is a navy blue day. It's wow. Tuesday. Saturday is white, Sunday is red, et cetera. So correlating days of the week with color was really my entry point in understanding what's going on here and where might it be coming from. But yes, yeah, so I'm quite familiar fact, with synesthesia. Fact, yeah, because that, that reminds me that Daniel Tramet wrote a book, didn't he, called Born on a Blue Day? Blue Day, that's correct. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and Tramet, Tramet I feature in one of my books. And I also feature the work of the... Um, the late uh, Daryl Trefford, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who worked with autistic people and, in fact, was the guy that worked with my virtual namesake, Kim Peek, who was the, the guy that the Rain Man was based upon. Mm. But somebody else who I think you know was doing some fascinating work with auti um, precognitive autistic children uh, is uh, Diana, Diane Hennessy Powell. Yes. Uh -huh. And I think I you know you. Diane, don't you? Um, and her work is extraordinary because she has a group of children who are autistic. Uh, some of them are nonverbal, but they're mm. precognitive, and she's mm -hmm. proved it. Yeah, and they can, I can, they can read thoughts. That's a um, correlation that's not surprising to me at all, including things as extreme as uh, being able to read holding a book with the eyes closed. I know that yeah. Caroline Corey, I want to give her a shout out, has done a lot of work in that area and really. Well, fun, those if anybody's really interested in something to witness something extraordinary, um, myself and uh, my associate, Sarah, who does who, when we were doing the consciousness hour, we interviewed a young woman who is autistic, Australian girl who's autistic um, and has the full term it's, it's it's more than superior autobiographical memory it's like hyper superior autobiographical memory and her name has escaped me now but it will come to me in a second and we we were on live on my podcast mm -hmm. and i decided to test her because she claims that she remembers everything in her life including her dreams including being in the womb and everything else mm. now i knew from something she'd said to me in a previous chat that she was a great fan of um, Harry Potter. Now, Sarah has a young daughter who also loves Harry Potter. So Sarah has all the Harry Potter books in her apartment. So I turned around to the young lady in question and I said, we're going to test you now. Do you mind if I ask Sarah to pick a page at random from a random Harry Potter novel? Pick a page at random and pick a paragraph at random and start reading it and see if you can finish it. <laughs> Sarah did this. Believe it or not, Sarah read three of the words. And the young girl read out the whole paragraph from her mind's eye. That is on my website and it's on my YouTube channel when it happened live. Now, that is inexplicable because Inexplic we, have, we have to argue where, again, is... Where is her memory being processed here? We know, as you said, from Carl Pribram and, and Carl Lashley that Pribram yes, worked with. That's right. These yep. guys spent forever trying to find the Enneagram, the place in the brain where memory is, is located. They trained rats and everything else. And Carl Lashley, at the end of his career, came to the conclusion that, that memory is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Carl Pribram argued this, rather like his associate David Bohm argued, that again, memory is works holographically. Mm -hmm. It works within the brain on holographic principles. Now, again, I think this is to do again with the astroglial network. And I think there's a linkage here yeah. with the astroglial network. And I'm really excited and I'm desperate really to, to start testing this stuff out under controlled conditions. Because I think I really have something here. And I just wish 
the academics would listen to me. You don't need them. You don't need probably them. Probably not. Probably not. But <laughs> but effectively, we need you know, you. <laughs> oh, right. That's true. So so there are all these areas and synesthesia and everything else. You know, it's so exciting. It is. There very is exciting. so much information out there, and there's so much information in my books that you know. And I think it's because I I have a virtually eidetic memory. So if I read something, I don't forget it. I don't remember it like my friend in Australia did, but I don't forget it. And my brain is very good at reading something and immediately remembering something I read 10 years ago. A reference, absolutely. And drawing that and then pulling the things together. And I think because I'm, I'm so eclectic in my interests and because of my unique, strange memory capacity, I'm able to bring these things together. So when I write a book, you know, as I start writing the book properly, all these bits and pieces just drop into my brain and I'm going, no, that's where that links. That's where this links. Absolutely. And it works. Yeah. And it's my day. It's my day. Well, I'm right. kind of, kind of linking in as, as you're talking to me, I'm seeing, I, I get images as you're, as you're explaining certain ideas. Um, and there was one that just came in and went out. <laughs> we need you because so many people, Anthony, are having these experiences and don't know how to substantiate them. They're having these experiences where that that are outside of the realm of possibility, and they don't know from whence it came. <laughs> they don't know where it's coming from. And your yes. model explains where it may be coming from. Moreover, once you get deeper into this research, your model may be able to help people self-initiate or regulate. Yes these sorts of experiences. Totally. I mean, I feel it is so important. I'm regularly contacted by people who experience temporal lobe epilepsy, people who yes. experience classic migraine, schizophrenia, and various other non-standard mental states. And they read my books and they say, you're the only person in the world that's doing this. You're the only person that's actually describing it as it is. Now, to me, we we discuss scientifically, we discuss the scientific method, and we discuss that we need to look at things empirically. Yes. I, I point out that the word empirical is Latin for experience. Mm. So therefore, when somebody has an experience, don't dismiss it just because it doesn't fit in with your scientific paradigm. Doesn't real, it's not real. You know, we have no idea what um, hallucinations are, you know. I, I call a lot of this modern science idiot, idiot, idiopathic science. Yeah. You know, if you go to see a doctor and the doctor's not sure what's wrong with you, like they might think you have epilepsy, they'll say, oh, we know what you've got. You've got idiopathic epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Idiopathic means we haven't got a clue. That's what it means. And it, I call it idiopathic science. You know, it's, it's because 90% of the things fit. Therefore, we have the solution. Absolutely. But of course, we know from from the theory of scientific revolutions, Thomas Kuhn, the famous theory of scientific revolutions, a sociological paper written about 1970 or a book written about 1970, like 68, 1970. And in that, he points out how the medieval schoolmen explained and kept the idea that the, the, the earth was the center of the universe. And they explain the retrograde motion of the outer planets by something called um, epicycles. And they had all these tortuous mathematical calculations to explain it, which technically worked, but they were wrong. And it was only when Copernicus came along and Kepler and said, well, you don't need all that, because if you put the sun at the center of the solar system, suddenly it all works. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is where we are now. We have this epicyclical science that is work sort of but we know that 93 percent of the universe 96 percent of the universe is missing mm. we don't know what dark energy is we don't know what dark matter is but although they claim that they do no you're absolutely right yeah but they they right. don't all they, they don't. only call it dark because it's dark they don't know what it is mm -hmm. they just know from the way in which as vera rubin i think it was discovered as galaxies rotate, they were rotating in completely the wrong way. Hmm. And the only way they can explain the, the way in which gravity works within a galaxy as it swirls is that there's much more matter around the galaxy that we cannot see called dark matter. Or it could be that there's a law of nature that we just haven't seen. Absolutely. And we're creating 
the epicycles of dark matter to explain something. You'd think scientists would learn. You'd think that the whole hubris of modern science, every civilization thinks its science is the pinnacle. Absolutely. But no but previous science has ever been the pinnacle. Yeah. As yeah. we discovered in 1900 when Max Planck stood up in December 1900 and made his presentation about quanta. Before then, a few years before, um, uh, uh, I think it was Mitchelson, who of the Mitchelson-Morley experiment at the University of Chicago, stood up and said, we know so much about science now. <laughs> All the future scientists are going to be doing is calculating to the sixth decimal point. Six years later, bang, the whole Did thing blew up. It's really something. This, this of course, is a whole other conversation um, of uh, giant proportions, but I will quote a physicist who I admired for years, Dana Zohar, when she commented on individuals, uh, particularly the uh, materialist uh, lack of belief in the life after life phenomenon. And she said, uh, people have experiences and science denies the experience because they don't have the instruments of the moment to measure it, period. And the bottom line is that the, the, the instruments that they, they use to quantify certain experiences may never uh, show up on the scene. So that that being said, we have to go outside of that realm. And I think well, it's we something, are. Well, it's something within science. It's called promissory materialism. Mm. And promissory materialism was, I think it was uh, Eccles, I think, came up with this. And it's the idea that modern science says, well, we can't explain this now. But we will be able to. We, we, can't ex we can't explain the hard problem of consciousness, the Chalmers hard problem of consciousness, but we will. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That's given a promissory note. You have no idea that you're going to be able to explain it. And yeah. until you actually break out of the glass ceiling you've put around yourself, you're never going to explain it because you're not thinking in the right way. That's right. That's absolutely right. It's an ideological problem. We have gone in so many different directions and we still have so much to cover and we are running out of time. But before we go any further, you guys, we talked about the Consciousness Connection, this fabulous event that's coming up in just a couple of weeks from now that's being produced by Tracy Garbett Dolan and her husband, Richard Dolan, will be participating. He's going to be kind of a supporting <laughs> role in this. And I'm so excited that both you and I, Tony, will be a part of this amazing program you're going to be speaking about. I wanted to spend at least a little bit of time talking about your talk, which will have to do with the link. I think we've touched on it between near-death experience, out-of-body experience, and the UFO encounter phenomenon. Give us a little thumbnail. I, and again, all of these things are not too dissimilar to, to what you're going to be mm. presenting in the talk, I would imagine. I don't, I don't want you to give it away, but let's get into yeah. that a little bit. What, well, it's, it's to do with the similarities between out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, and alien abductions, mm -hmm. and adding in uh, entity encounters, dimethyltryptamine entity encounters. There's, they're too similar. They seem to have similarities here. Now, I know that way back in 1984, I think it was, Kenneth Ring wrote a book called The Amiga Project, NDEs, UFOs, and Mind at Large. So even the researchers, the great NDE researchers such as Ken Ring, have been making these links in, in the past. Also, I know that Raymond Moody was also very interested in a lot of the linkages between the NDE experience and, and UFOs. And I think it's to do with how, the, 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 how it manifests. Now, again, you and I were both at um, Breaking Convention last year. And I met a number of people there that I spent a lot of time talking to who'd had um, entity encounters when they were children. And this particularly intrigued me because a lot of my research is to do with um, other forms of entity encounters with children. Children, when they encounter what um, uh, a character called Michael J. Halliwell called quasi-corporal companions, uh, QCCs or more jokingly, the Invisi kids. And this is where children have friends, invisible friends. And we know lots of children have had these. And it's because the imagination of a child is broader. But not only that, I'd argue that from the experiments I was talking about earlier on, there's something else about children's brains that's of profound importance here. 
And again, I'm probably one of the few writers in the world that's talking about this. And it's to do with myelination of the brain and myelination of the neurons. Now, the neurons, I think, are there to, as we said, close the brain down, to stop you having a broader experience of reality. Myelination is the insulation of the neurons. It's like, imagine a neuron, it's like an electrical cable. In order to keep the electrical current inside, you need to insulate it. And this is what myelin does within the brain, it insulates the, the neurons from the outside world. But for children, they don't have that myelination. It starts when they're a child, which means that their neurons, and I'd argue their astroglial network, is open far more to other stimulants, other ways of seeing the world. And this is why children have great imaginations. This is why children feel there are ghosts under the bed. You remember as a child, the world you lived in as a child was timeless. Time went forever. The summers lasted forever. And the beings and things you saw seemed to be real. Now, I believe there are some people, as they get older, they don't, the, the myelination maybe doesn't happen in quite the same way. And they continue to be able to perceive these entities as they get older. Now, initially, they will interpret them as being playmates. They'll interpret them in many ways. They won't have the cognitive ability to link them to greys or aliens because they won't know about that within their worldview. But as soon as they start to do this, suddenly they'll start making associations with these entities and they will label them as being aliens. Now, the amount of times you have in near-death experiences, which I believe at the point of death, the brain then opens itself up again. And this is why we have the near-death experience. And again, I haven't got time to go into the neurochemical factors in this, but I do in the book. But suffice to say, the near-death experience is similar to having an alien encounter or a DMT facilitated encounter, because it seems to be like an out of body experience. A lot of people, when they have alien encounters, suddenly find themselves being risen up out of the body and being sucked into a device that's above them. Or as a child having an out of body experience, it's the same sensation of rising up out of the body. Then we have the out of body experience, one of the moody traits of the near death experience. So there's all this out of body experiencing going on. Mm. But when people are in out of body experience, they encounter other entities. And these entities seem to be similar. Now, particularly I'll cite the example of my own mother when she had an entity encounter one evening. She phoned me up the next day to say that she'd woken up in the middle of the night. She couldn't move and the door was open to her bedroom. She then saw three spindly fingers come through the bed, both behind the bedroom door and this creature. And she described it as having huge black eyes, two holes for a nose and a slit for a mouth. And it looked at her and dodged back. My mother wouldn't know a grey if it bit her on the backside, okay? But she saw one. She described exactly that. Now, in my presentation, I'll be showing children's pictures, children's drawings of greys. Children see greys all the time. But it's not just children. There are cave paintings that were recently discovered in, in northern India. And in these cave paintings that have been sealed for three or 4,000 years, the cave paintings have alien greys. Absolutely, yes. And this is because the shamanic tradition, children will be taken and will be put in darkness. And they're put in darkness for a reason. Because darkness stimulates the pineal gland to release endogenous, that is internally generated dimethyltryptamine. It's that that brings about the hallucinatory states that people have in near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, and everything else. It's endogenous dimethyltryptamine, and it's synthesized from melatonin. So melatonin, they're very, very similar structures in terms of their molecule shape. So what happens is that you go into what my mother's state was called sleep paralysis, when mm -hmm. you cannot move. Very common, yes. And it's profoundly common. And it's, it's, it's there to stop you damaging yourself when, you're, when you're, you're, you're dreaming, when you're in the dream state. Now, there are friends of mine who are incredible out-of-body people. 
there's a number of my associates and there's somebody else I know that you must interview is um, a, a researcher called Samantha Lee Treasure, mm-hmm. who's got who's going to have two books coming out um, in the next 18 months that are going to really blow people's minds. And Samantha had experiences as a child in, in her farm where she lived in Ontario in Canada where she she encountered entities. She now has out-of-body experiences where she sees her own future self. Mm. She goes to a place called Future Tokyo. Mm -hmm. She encounters entities. She encounters spirits. She encounters lots of things. But again, she's doing the science. So there seems to be something here that is linking. And it's to do as much as anything with electrical sensitivity, something we started the conversation on. It's as if electrical sensitivity triggers our abilities to see these entities in one way or another. So near-death experiences are OBEs under different circumstances. Entity encounters are the same throughout society, seeing angels. They're all the same phenomenon. And once we start seeing the patterns, we're going to be able to make it the solution. And we'll discover that they're actually part of ourselves. They are in many ways us manifesting through us yeah coming full circle here we are i love it what a powerful theme anthony (laughs) i said this the last time you were on and we did do the part two so now we're at part three or four i'm going to ask you to come back for a part five because it's just this is just too much not too much it's it's so rich and so necessary and i know many in our audience and many out there in the world right now want answers to their own. This comes down to understanding self. It comes down to self-discovery through the eyes of someone like yourself that has invested so much time and brilliance in, in this work. We're not done yet. There are a couple more things I want to I want to bring up before we close out. We're of course going to go to Patreon. I had a couple of ideas. We want to talk about, you've got <coughs> some great experiments coming up, not the least of which is the Philip experiment recreated. Have you all heard of the Philip experiment? It's going to talk about that, but here's, I'm going to put this out right now as far as Patreon is concerned. And then we have a question from our membership over on Patreon for you. We're going to ask here. I would love your take. Don't answer here. We're going to take it to the after show on the phenomenon of number sequences and why so many are being bombarded by them, because I know your answer will be so different from anything you've ever heard. So guess what? That's what we're going to be talking about as well over in the after show of your game, Tony. I hope you are. Absolutely. (laughs) Okay. All right. Now, as for the Patreon question, this is from Victorina. Always love hearing from you. She had a question for you, Anthony. She wants to know, we have not touched on the simulation theory, yet another topic we could spend an hour on. If we are actually living, let's assume that we could be in a virtual reality. Could the beings, extraterrestrials, fairies, spirit beings, DMT creatures, be a form of highly advanced nanobots that are programmed to maintain this, quote, app by providing guidance, pre-programmed responses, and reassurance assurance according for the, this is a long one, for the individual beliefs, while also doing their general maintenance, which might include civilization breakdowns, resets, and rebuilds. That was a long mm-hmm. one, but let's see if you can... Yeah, no, I think that, that that's, a, that's a possibility. Um it is one of the the original ideas of the simulation theory was put forward by a guy called Nick Bostrom mm-hmm. in the 1990s, who is a Swedish mathematician at Cambridge, I think. And Bostrom's argument was quite straightforward. You know, the, the simulation that we're living in is is a program that has been created by our own future self, by our own uh, um, descendants. And Hmm. he used the argument of Moore's law and saying, you know, that Moore's law, you know, where computer chips can double in terms of their capacity every two years, which expanded outwards. But of course, what Moore wasn't aware of or Nick Bostrom at the time was about quantum computing and how that can work using uh, qubits, which are quantum bits, which work in multiple universes to do the calculations, which is now something that is happening. Google have got a quantum computer they're working on. And then you have on top of that, you know, AI and the way AI is working. And we say with nanobots and everything else as well. So the level of scientific knowledge and processing power that would be available to our descendants two or three hundred years in the future could be so extraordinary 
that they could create ancestor sims. And if they created ancestor sims, what they populate ancestor sims with? Sim sims of their ancestors that they could possibly recreate using DNA code. So you and I and all of us could be recreated using our DNA. And then we are placed within a three-dimensional virtual reality version of our lives hmm. that we exist within. Now, again, this is not as crazy as it sounds. You know, we all use, many of us use virtual headsets, you know, and you go into Second Life and various things like this. How could you tell if you were in a simulation? You couldn't. But it's very important that we don't use the word simulation because simulation suggests that it's a copy of something else. I much prefer Dr. Andrew Gallimore, who was one of the fellow speakers at the break, um, Contact in the Desert last yeah. year. He calls it an instantation. And I think that's much better as a term. It's the idea. It's, it's, it's instantiating itself. It's very, very intriguing. And again, if anybody wants to get hold of a book that really blows the lid off this, Andrew Gallimore's Alien Information Theory is really interesting because he's arguing that, yes, it's alien information that's being processed to create the world we're living within. Hmm. We are able to think outside the box now because we understand VR. We don't understand how VR works. Only the people who designed it do. But we understand the principles of it. And suddenly it makes so much sense. But the only caveat I'd put on that is every society tries to explain the universe using its own understanding of technology. There was the mechanical universe of the Victorians. We are probably doing the set falling into the same trap. It's probably created out of technology that we can only can't even vaguely imagine. Mm -hmm. As Isaac Asimov once said, for the science of the science of future generations will be so great. And so strange to us, it will be damn near magic. Yeah. And of course, uh, it was there that the the uh, Isaac Asimov uh, debate, was it in 2008, Anthony, with a, a, in New York? Um, what was the, it was the Isaac Asimov simulation debate. Uh, anyway, nonetheless, yeah. So as usual, fantastically intricate and, and helpful answer. But now let's bring in the beings and how they relate in this whole uh, um, I'm not going to say simulation, but this this reality yeah, construct. The, the I, you sometimes I sometimes believe that there's a concept German concept called Zeitgeist. Yes, and it's okay. it's world spirit. Um, Weltgeist is world spirit. Zeitgeist, spirit of the day, and it's the idea that there are certain things that we we know instinctively, and we place it within our media, we place it within our movies and everything else. And I'm reminded here of a sequence that took place in a very, very cheating the ferryman like movie from 1999 called Vanilla Sky, mm. Tom, Tom Cruise. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, anybody who's seen that movie, uh, there's two things I'd like to point out. The first thing is if anybody's got it on DVD, here's a bit of fun for you. When Tom Cruise is on the roof with Penelope Cruz and they have that wonderful discussion of we'll meet again when we are cats, which I absolutely adore. It's such a lovely idea. And he decides he's going to jump off the building. And do you remember, he runs past the psychiatrist and he jumps off the building and he's falling. And as he's falling, they're playing the music of one of my favorite bands, Sigur Ross, the Icelandic band. And he's falling. And as he's falling, what you need to do is go on to freeze frame. And go frame by frame as he falls. And you will be astonished what you see. Hmm. It's a pan. It's a near-death panoramic life review. It's a series of still photographs of somebody's life, and it's the life of Cameron Crowe, the director, and he put that right at the end of the movie. Really interesting, but that's not the point I'm trying to make about Vanilla Sky. That's you a remember, good one, in, remember in Vanilla Sky, the guy again. My memory, how my brain works is weird. David Ames is the is the character, the Tom Cruise character. And he's in a bar. And there's this guy comes into the bar and starts talking to him and starts to explain that he's living in the final moments of his life and he's, he's living his life again. And you remember Tom Cruise turns around and says, shut the F up. And what the the entity does, and this entity is a bot who's who's been sent in to his simulation to tell mm. him something. It makes everything freeze. Everything stops and nobody moves in the in the in the in the room. 
I know somebody that that happened to. I know somebody who has temporal lobe epilepsy, excuse, temporal lobe epilepsy and has had that happen to her where reality has frozen and she's been watching it move really slowly. It mm -hmm. freezes and then it starts again. So there are clues there. So there we have the bots going in there. We have the idea of the matrix, which came around about the same time. Mm -hmm. These the adjustment bureau is another one, which of course is Philip K. Philip Dick. K. Dick, that's correct. You Absolutely. know, and you then you know have Minority Report, Philip K. Dick, the idea that people are precogs that they can see the immediate future, and again, these people like Philip K. Dick in my book, Philip, A Life of Philip K. Dick, the Man Who Remembered the Future. That's exactly what I talk about: is how precognitive he was, sociologically, culturally. And also personally, because he saw things in his own future. And of course, I'll be talking about that, isn't it? doing a whole section on Philip K. Dick in Contact in the Desert this summer. I'll be doing an intensive, a three-hour intensive on Philip K. Dick mm -hmm. for anybody that's interested. So yes, I agree totally with that. Wow. Love it. Oh my gosh. Where do we go from here? Well, we go next door, but I'm going to say again, you've got to come to the Consciousness Connection if nothing else, we've got obviously a great lineup of, of speakers, uh, including Russell Targ is going to be a part of this. It's mm. going to be great. We're going to be covering, uh, or the, the event will be covering precognition, retrocausation, lucid dreaming. I will be doing a talk on uh, Between Two Worlds, how to integrate all of the things that Tony and I have been talking about today with getting up and having to go to work and dealing with your boss the next day. How do we reconcile those two very vastly different worlds? And of course, your talk on the link, links, plural, between NDEs, OBEs, and the UFO encounter phenomenon. So it is going to be great. January 27th and the 28th, it's a weekend retreat. And of course, we'll have a link below. So I'd love for you to join us. And Tony and Absolutely. I may be hanging out in the chat. It's going to be fabulous. And although It'll I'd love be to be in your physical presence, this will be the next best thing. So looking forward to that. So we're going to sign off now. Listen, tell us where we can find you. I know where we, we can find you. We can Google him and find him, but you you let the audience know. Yeah. Um, you can Google me. I'm everywhere. Yeah. I know, <laughs> sort of right. these days, it seems to be. Um, but in terms of contacting me now, as, as I regularly say now, the, the, the issue I have, I don't have a an admin team in the back behind me. My wife does my accounts for me and my tax returns but that's it so i don't have a, a team behind me and at the moment i'm getting between 50 and 60 messages emails a day mm. i can't humanly respond to them all but i do read them all and if ones are particularly interesting i might get back to you but it doesn't mean by contacting me i don't read it now you can contact me um i'm very active on instagram i know you are Cheat the uh, and cheat the ferryman so i'm on instagram and i post regularly there i love it i love instagram and just banging things out there i'm also very very active on various uh, facebook pages uh, but my own anthony peak page is the one where you'll directly get me and i have a page for each of my books on there um and i also have uh, what's a growingly popular youtube channel as well Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of days ago, I posted something about what's going to be happening, including discussing our event at the end of the month and contact in the desert and some of the events I'm doing as well. My website is anthonypeak.com. Um, you can get my books and your local library. You don't have to buy them. You can go to your local library. Most libraries in the United States and in the UK, if they don't have copies of my books readily available, they will have them on order. So you don't have to buy them. So I'm not trying to make you buy my books. But if you do want to buy my books, you can order them from bookshops. Some of them sometimes are on the shelves, sometimes not. Um, you can also go on Amazon, uh, where my books are all there together in all formats, including Audible, which I had to audition myself to read my own books. But there you go. I supposedly <laughs> had the right kind of voice for it, which was brilliant. Um, you also, uh, they're on Kindle. Um, they are everywhere. And also on my website, I also have stuff that you can download and you can use. But get involved. We are a worldwide community now. And get along to Contact in the Desert if you can. We had a fantastic time last year. There was, was a whole great. group of us that got together. And this year it's going to be even more exciting. Absolutely. Because of the things that are going to be happening. So come so get between together. Con between the consciousness connection, contact in the desert, it's going to be all that and so much more. Tony, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've frozen. 
this is okay. this is yeah we are frozen but we're still rolling so <laughs> let me sign off with the journeyers thanks as always for joining us for higher journeys and we shall see you soon if not even sooner next door on patreon Goodbye, don't hang folks. up tony we're gonna go next door <laughs> we'll talk to you soon bye-bye okay.